take a second to get all in here on the sermon notes, okay? Uh, while those are getting passed out, I guess, you know, and I think of all in, I have to tell you, unfortunately, I think of poker. How many of you, when you think of all in, you think of poker? How many? Yeah, didn't want to explain that to kids. So, I mean, are y'all, how many of you here, y'all you know what all in is in poker? I mean, okay. I, I appreciate some innocence out there, okay? Uh, because, because one of the things I'm going to tell you, I believe God was all in before there was poker and all in. But I do have to tell you that, that all in today has become a poker term because what happens is a guy gets some chips, okay? And all of a sudden, for whatever reason, whether he has a good hand or he's wanting to bluff or there's a lot of strategy, like the wine you would do it, but all of a sudden a guy will all of a sudden take all of his chips and push him into the middle of the table. All of his chips. How, what, how many of his chips? All of his chips. And we did what? At that moment, he's all in. Okay? But, because like, whatever happens on that hand, he's either going to get a whole lot, or he's done. He's all in. And, and, and yeah, so I'm, it's kind of interesting that Either not many of you were willing to own it in church, you know, like I get that. Even me as a pastor, you know, like I'm not a poker phrase, he phrase all in because it, it, I, I mean it is. But let me tell you what I'm, what I'm telling you today is God was all in before there was poker. And there's a lot of things in life, not just poker, where you have to commit yourself. You have to be all in. Okay, if you're going to be good at a sport, if you're going to be good at something in life, you generally have to get all in. You can't just half do it. You have to make a commitment. You have to be all in. And so that is the phrase today, all in. And so I appreciate you guys passing those out. And uh, I'm going to read our scriptures today because one thing, Aaron did a great job with the, with the Next Generation message. Uh, of explaining that, that God was all in. Let me also tell you, we took Holy Communion today, the Lord's Supper, the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what that lets us know, Jesus was all in. And we partook today of His provision, of His all inness. Okay? And so John 3.16, we all know, I believe, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. We'll, we'll come back and I'll talk about the all in this of that. But, but then when Jesus walked this earth, he called for an all inness of those that would follow him. He called for an all inness of those who would follow him. For Jesus said to them, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and in his Father's glory and of the holy angels. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, I pray today that you'll make this Real to us, Father God, to understand uh, what it means for us to be all in today, to, to maybe have a vision of that, to examine our hearts, Father God. That's really the point of the visual is to is to, to be able to examine our hearts and then maybe also gain understanding as we meet people and come in contact with people at different times uh, in our lives. So Lord, bless this sermon, bless this word today. Give us your wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, where we're starting at, where, we, where, we, where we're moving into, is for us to realize, you know, we celebrated Easter last week. You know, Maundy Thursday, where Jesus went to the garden 
and Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours be done. Then Good Friday, where Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. And then Easter, Resurrection Sunday. And in that celebration, we were celebrating God's all in this for us. We were celebrating His all in this for us. We can see that God the Father was all in on our behalf. Because out of His great love for us, He was willing to send His Son Jesus to suffer and to die on the cross so that we might have life in His name. Uh, as a parent, you know, as we, if you're a parent, and you ever, you know, for your children, you, you, you love your children and you want what's best, and you don't want to ever see them suffer or have hardship, and to think that God knew He was sending Jesus to the earth, to suffer on the cross. And you get how all in that is. Okay? But then Jesus, and, and, and you, Jesus knew the cross was going to be an agonizing death. And that's why He prayed in the garden, Lord, if there's any other way for the salvation of humanity other than my death, please, Lord, but not my will, but Yours be done. And Jesus was all in. He was all in for the love of the Father because He loved His Heavenly Father. And He was all, he was all in because He loved each one of us. Uh, Jesus knew that what He was doing was going to echo through the ages because even when He prayed with His disciples, He said, I pray not only for these, He's talking about His disciples, but I'm praying for those who will believe in Me through them. He could see us sitting here today. And He was all in when He went to the cross. I'm going to say I believe the Holy Spirit was all in too uh, because the Holy Spirit was the resurrection power. Last Sunday we talked about the same power that rolled the stone away. What's the rest? Same power alive in us today. So the Holy Spirit had an all in this because the Holy Spirit, the resurrection power of God to raise Jesus from the dead, to roll the stone away and bring Jesus back to life. So I hope that you know today that God is all in on your behalf, on my behalf. God is all in on our behalf. And it has a, a joint thing, but it's also very personal. I, I love that saying. If we'd have been the only one, Jesus would have died just for us. God is that all in. Okay? So, so that's the foundation of this message is that God is all in. Are you with me? Are you with me? God is all in. Okay? Now what I want us to look at to the question that, that we're going to, on our side of the equation is, are we all in for God and for His kingdom purposes? Now, one of the problems for me is I'm a very visual person. Okay? And, and I like seeing things. When I see things, it helps me process things. And so quite often in my spiritual life, God kind of gives me illustrations, whether they're good or bad, I don't know, but they help me and my feeble mind to understand. And so this illustration today, that colorful page, is kind of my way of, 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 of self-examination, okay? But I've also learned that it's helpful for me too as I engage in encountering other people to some degree. And I'll, I'll explain that because, uh, you know, I mean, we don't always totally know or understand other people. Uh, so, so on this page, there's like six categories on the page, okay? Uh, there's way more than six categories, people, okay? And mine's not exhaustive, but you got to have something to kind of get your bearings and work with. So work with me about the six categories. It's not exact, but I'm hoping that it can give us some, some perspective, okay? Down kind of at the bottom left-hand corner, that first category is people who are lost and they don't know they are lost. And let me tell you what, on top of not knowing they are lost, they don't care. They are living their lives for themselves. There's almost a sense in which they're reveling in their lostness. We see this in our culture and our society a lot of times with some of the movies or some of the entertainment, some of the different things that come out that just almost seems to revel in the vileness or the, you know, the perverseness or whatever word you want to use. And it's like we're lost and we, we, don't, we don't care. And most of the time don't even know. 
And if you try to witness or speak to them, there's no telling what kind of verbiage or signage with their hands that they might, might give you. Because they don't want to hear it. They just want to revel in their lostness. And so just save all of your religious stuff. You know, and, and here's the deal. The vast majority of people in the world today, this is the category, this is the largest category of the six. People who are lost, they don't know that they're lost. And on top of that, they don't care. Always you think, what can we do for those kind of people? Two things. Pray and love them. Pray and love them. What can we do for those type of people who are lost? They don't even know they're lost. And on top of that, they don't care. Is we pray for them and we love them. Okay? But let me tell you what. This next category of people is a very interesting category of people. Because they're lost. And, 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 and generally, like, like sometimes you get right at that place where they're aware that they're lost. But more often, you kind of catch them in that place where they're lost. And they're beginning to become aware that they're lost. Okay? Uh, Caleb, can I talk about you for just a second? How old were you down in Houston when you kind of realized you had to make some changes? When Caleb was 29, he was down in Houston. He was, in a, he was not living, a, he was living a rough life, okay? And he looked around and he realized that all of his friends were either dead or in jail. He began to become aware that he was lost. Because before that, he was just living. But all of a sudden, he began to become aware that I'm lost. And i got to make some changes because all of my friends are either dead or they're in jail. And that, that awareness of lostness can come a bunch of different ways. It can, you know, because you don't have to be that far out there. You can, you, know, you can be a lot of different places in life. But all of a sudden, there begins to become some awareness. I'm lost. And I'm becoming aware that I'm lost. And consequences can quite often be a part of that awareness. That there, there gets to be a consequences with lostness. And a lot of times you start getting sick of those consequences. And you think, how are these consequences? Well, you're going to have to change behavior. Well, a lot of times you change behavior and, 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 and it's beyond you. Jesus murdered yesterday when they gave the call at the end of the sermon. There were 12 to 15 people that went forward. Okay? It was really awesome. And, and it was quite interesting, some of the people that went forward. But, but there was one guy in particular I was drawn to, and I went to hug him. And when I hugged him, he just reeked of alcohol. I mean, reeked of alcohol. And what you know is he's tired of those consequences. And he's beginning to become aware that he's lost and, he, and he's tired. But the question is now, will he have the strength? Will there be somebody walking through this with him to see him out? The guy that was praying with him was taking his phone number. They were exchanging numbers and, and they prayed for him. But let me tell you what, his battle is going to be last night. It's going to be today. It's going to be all through this week to see how that goes, okay? But he went forward yesterday because he was lost and he's becoming aware that he's lost. And wanting to make some changes. I'm going to come back to this a little bit later, but you, you got the picture, right? Okay? Because then we hit the cross, we hit the cross, and we start coming out on the other side of the cross now, okay? I, I want to tell you that that last category, that second category, there's not tons of people in that category, okay? But it's an interesting category, and it's out there, okay? Now then, we hit the cross. And you come to the other side of the cross. When you hit the cross, you come to realize that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believes in Him. And you step into salvation. Okay? You step into salvation. And uh, so on that, that first group on that other side, this third category is those who are saved and going to church. But they're saved and they're going to church and there's little or no life change, little or no transformation in how they are living their lives. Their lives, in fact, don't look a whole lot different from those who are not saved. Other than on Sunday morning, they seem to put some clothes on 
and go to church. But their lives don't look a whole lot different than those that are on the other side. Okay? Uh, they're still mostly selfish, mostly self-focused, mostly self-directed. Self -directed. A lot of times you've heard me describe this category as being what? Anybody got that? If, I had to, if we were in a Take Bible study, this would be a dollar question. They are, and there's two blanks here. What is it? They are, hello. Help me, Jesus, not to get discouraged in the middle of my sermon. All right. Church members. Church members. Come on, Bill. Because what, what, what's the, what do I contrast that with sometimes? That you're a church member or you're, or you're a what? Disciple. Thank you. I'll give you a dollar later. All right. Uh, yeah, but, but church members. There's a whole bunch of people that what they are, they're church members. And their lives don't look a whole lot different than anybody else in the world. Maybe that maybe they try to do good. Maybe they try to find a place to serve. Generally, they're going to go to church some Sundays. You know, sometimes they really get good. They go every Sunday, but they're just going to church. And I, I really, I would probably say they're saved. Okay, you can have a discussion about that, but I'm gonna, I would tend to say they're saved. And maybe, but you know, but there's just not a lot of fruit. There's not a lot of transformation. And they don't look that much different. And I want to tell you, this is one of the number one reasons why the church struggles to reach those that are under 30 to come to church. Because they look at that lukewarm Christianity that doesn't really mean anything. And it's like, I got better stuff to do on Sunday. Then go be a part of something that's having no impact. And the churches where you'll find most the 20 year olds that are going to church is where they're going and they're, they're, there's people there that, that they're living different. They're living transformed and young people then get drawn into it. They're interested in that because it means something. And so it needs to mean something to us. Okay? Over on this other side of the cross, there's four categories. And this, unfortunately, is the largest category over on that side of the cross. A lot of people going to church and it not meaning a whole lot. Okay? You with me? Now we, we start moving into a little bit different, different place when we get into that, into that fourth group. Because the fourth category is those who are saved... And they've invited God into their hearts and into their lives. They've invited God into their hearts and their lives, into their dreams, into their plans. But then they usually kind of themselves, they determine how much of their lives, how much of their income they're going to give to God. Kind of like, okay, you get to sit in that room. Oh, no, hey, I'll tell you what, you can sit in that room or that room, you choose. But no, can't go over here. Can't mess with that. Don't touch that. So God's invited in, but still kind of they're the ones that are in control. But even inviting God, God in begins to bring some transformation, generally a stronger sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. So this one is not necessarily a bad place to be because God's invited in. He's a, he's a gentleman. He doesn't force himself, but he's there. His spirit is there. And he will begin to, uh, to bring you know, some conviction. Hey, Lamont, did you get a handout? No, that's a bulletin. Do we have more handouts? Dave, Lamont, next to the back row back there. Good to see you, fine man. If you need any yard work done or just work in general, Lamont is one of the hardest workers you will ever meet in your life. And, and he's got broader perspective than that. But uh, there was one day Debbie had left for work and Lamont came over. And when she came home, there were over 70 bags of leaves stacked on our sidewalk. And Debbie goes, you're telling me one guy did that? And I'm like, it's amazing. So appreciate you being here, Lamont. And he's an awesome brother, too. Like, it's more than just that. He's an awesome brother, but uh, he's helped me, so I appreciate him being here today. And uh, he's got an awesome heart. 
Hey, you, did you get that page with the pictures, man? All right, because we're on session. We're on four. We're on the fourth one, okay? Uh, the fourth one, right, is the ones that have invited God in. You with me? Okay. Now we go to the fifth one. And the fifth category is those who are saved and have surrendered to God. The key word here is surrendered. Okay? They've surrendered to God. They've surrendered their plans, their dreams, and their lives to God. And God is at work bringing growth and transformation. People can usually readily see something different about them. A lot of times you can just like in their eyes, in their face, in their countenance, you're around them a little bit. You can sense there's something different about them. I want to tell you, when I was growing up in church, my dad was a pastor. I told you I had that drug problem growing up. You know, he got drugged to church all the time. You know, every time the doors were open. Uh, and and so, so, like, you know, I was drugged to church. And when you get to church, you meet a whole bunch of those people that are in category three. You know, they look like they had sour pickles for breakfast. And they're not happy and they're just ready for church to be over. They just are ready for church to be over. They sit there the whole time. They're really, you know, you can see. It's like, when's this done? So I check that box off. I gave God his deal. I'm ready to go home. I got plans this afternoon. The Cowboys are playing at noon. I want to see them. And they, and they don't really give a rip about anything. They're, they're checking a box. They're a church member. They get to do their duty. Say they did it. See everybody. Everybody sees them. And go home and then just keep living how they live. And I saw a bunch of people like that. But all of a sudden, you start noticing these other people. And when I was a sophomore in high school is when I said, God, I don't want to be like those sour pickle people. I want to be like some of those people that you can tell they got something different, that they seem to live different. They know you. And that's when God led me to Galatians 2.20. For I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And there's a surrenderedness. And in that surrenderedness, it opens up for God to come in more fully. Okay? Just, just so you're thinking, I tell you what, I hope, I hope I don't ever slide down into number, like that third category, just being a church member. I, there may be days that I slide back down all the way there, okay? And I never make it up to the last category, hardly ever make it up to the last category. I'm going to tell you about them. I hardly ever make it up there. But, but I live somewhere just kind of sliding along there, good days, bad days, asking God to help me, Jesus, you know, help him, Jesus. You got me? You know what I'm saying? Because we're saved by grace. And, and life changes day by day and things happen and we don't just get to one place and then we're there. Okay? It's not just a static deal. Alright? But that, but that key word for that fifth category is surrendered. Okay? And then the sixth category are those who have offered their lives to God as living sacrifices to give their lives for the least, the last, and the lost. A lot, they're involved in missions, usually a lot of times to some, some way. Even the people that do Jesus Burger, that's a mission. And you should see those people come work and serve and everything they do. And man, our kitchen was a buzz of activity and there's like 15 people in there. And also yesterday, our church hallway, when they were getting done, was a mess. And I was curious, like if they were going to clean it up, like or if Mike was going to have to clean it up. And, and man, they got, they had to go find the vacuum cleaner and they got brooms and they, they really worked hard to get everything cleaned up and, and they're serving. Okay. And so that we find our way to serve and it can be in missions that missions. My point of that is missions doesn't have to be going to a different country, you know, to be involved in missions. They're involved in missions. Uh, they're involved with ministries to orphans or to the poorest to the poor. They may be involved in ministries that are seeking to stop human trafficking, which is just an abomination to God. Uh, and God does undoubtedly the strength of their lives. I tell you somebody, when I think of this category, who comes to mind, uh, there was a professor at Letourneau. His name was Tom Helmut. He attended Crossroads Church where I was. And Tom was the head of the engineering department at Letourneau. And, and I got a feeling that's got to be a pretty good position. I mean, I know it would be an influential position to be head of the engineering depart, in, department at Letourneau. And he was involved in missions. But one day, God called him to go minister to orphans. 
and he and his wife and their four children at that time, four children, they got, they got five, they had adopted two, they adopted two street children from Columbia. Wouldn't you think that's, that's good? You know, we'll just settle for that, you know? That's our role. That's our deal. And it wasn't easy that that transition for those kids wasn't easy coming off the streets in Columbia. The little girl told about how they would uh, t get newspaper and tear up newspaper and put it in a bowl and get a couple of sugars from the restaurant and mix it in sugar water and then pour the sugar water over the newspaper, the shredded up newspaper, and they would eat that to get something in their stomach. And those are the kids that the Helmuth adopted. And you could think, well, that's enough. But no, then God called them to resign from that position at Letourneau. And they're now in Juarez, Mexico, serving at Rancho Los Amigos with the orphans there. And uh, then, like, have a salary, you know, a lot of stuff. And there's somebody that, that I would be a Category 6 type person. And, 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 and I'm always blessed to know those people. They challenge me. They inspire me. Okay? All right. All in. They're all in. We can be all in without being all the way to six, okay? You can be all in without being there. But what I'm asking you today, where are you at? You know, it's not, you know, you have to raise your hands down before I'm three. I'm at, you know, like, no, but hey, you know, like, like kind of generally locate yourself on the page and just let God speak to you about that, okay? Are you with me on this? Okay? This is a helpful thing for me. This challenges me. I don't just do this like today. I live with this in my mind and I want to be challenged in my walk with God. And this illustration helps challenge me in my walk with God. And one of the things I do, I like finding people who are five and six. Okay? I like finding people who are five and six. I like rubbing elbows and hanging out with those people because they inspire me. They challenge me. They bless me. They, they pull me forward, okay? But I also want to tell you, and this is the third point of the message. I think it's in the notes. I'm going there. The third point of this is, is it's also very interesting for us as Christians when, when, we, when we press forward to start being mindful of those two groups that are closest to the cross, okay? Those two groups that are closest to the cross. And the, the, the funnest group, the funnest group to really pay attention for is that person that's lost, that's becoming aware that they're lost. That is an awesome group to look for. That is an awesome group to look for. Because you're going to get to see some awesome stuff if you start hanging with them. And God just might use you to help find them a place to live or no telling what, you know, no telling what, you know, to help that person. And you'll, you'll be reminded how real God is. Because you'll see some heart and some life change that will boggle your mind. Remember last week I told you that the world tries to cover up the resurrection, the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus. And the world tries to bury it, but they never will because Jesus keeps changing lives. And it's so good for us to be reminded that when we get near somebody that's in that loss but becoming aware they're lost, we get to sit there and watch and a lot of times be a part of God's incredible transformation in what's going on. And we're reminded again, Jesus is real. God is real. God is awesome. And His power is awesome. And that other group on the other side of the cross, that saved group, they're an interesting group to be with and you got to love them and pray for them. They're the ones that if you hang around them too much, they'll suck the life out of you. They'll drain you dead. They'll get to you. If you got a little bit of life, you'll start comparing yourself to them. You go, man, I'm way better than that. And that's sick. It's sick on all accounts. And you know what's hard on that, that group that's just on the other side of the cross? They're kind of saved and they don't know there's anything more. Do you get that? They're kind of saved. Kind of saved. Here, here, I think it was C.S. Lewis. I'm pretty sure it was C.S. Lewis. Said the problem, and he did, he, it was that group of people who was talking about it. He had a different way of 
talking about them. He said, the problem with that group of people is they're inoculated with a vaccine against the gospel so that they're kind of immune to it. I talked a while back about $3 worth of God. And that group kind of has $3 worth of God. And they think they're doing good. And I just keep going up to church. But I tell you what, God loves that group of people. He loves them. And he hasn't given up on them. And quite often, because they go to church, they're exposed to a greater truth. And all of a sudden, God can begin opening their eyes to something greater, to something more. And a lot of times you can get around those people and you'll see God start to shake the chains off and shake the dust off and open their eyes and lead them into... into Amy looked at this and she goes, you know, I feel like I'm making progress up the mountain. Yeah, but I never really meant it to be like a mountain. But I will say that it's interesting because in the youth, when I was youth pastor for nine years, we had a group called Mountain Climbers. And, and I actually it stirred it back in my mind about some sermons and some teachings I did about mountain climbing and mountain climbers. Because we always are wanting to go higher or deeper, whatever word you want to use with God, you're more intimate in our relationship with God. Amen? And, and for me, I'm a visual person. So, so I shared this with you today because this is something that I use in my life to encourage, to challenge myself. And, and then like the, the two things about that is I like finding people that are fives and sixes and trying to hang out with those people or stay in contact with those people because they bless me and challenge me. And then I also... In my mind, I'm very cognizant of in that those two groups right closest to the cross of how to encourage, bless, and challenge them forward in their relationship with God. And, and, and it, it, it's, it's where a huge blessing lies when God begins to touch the lives right there in those categories and shake things up in some dramatic ways. And so I want us to live with eyes of faith, looking for people in those situations, especially the ones that are in that third category that, that are starting to realize there's more. There's more. Because you know what's awesome in God? There's always more. That's what's awesome in God. There's always more. And one of the things that's awesome in God is God is all in toward us. He's always all in. And the challenge of my heart and my life is to try to be all in back. And man, that's hard. And I don't do it very well. But I get some people around me that try to kick my rear end there. Like a tin can, just keep kicking it down the road, keep, keep kicking it up the hill. You know, I want that's where I want to be. We're going to take a moment to have some prayer so you can just talk to God about this. Are you with me? Remind you with me? You're awesome. We're going to take a moment where we just have some prayer and let God speak to our hearts and us speak to him and us be all in with God. So the altar's open. I invite you to take a moment and come and pray. And, and you can pray where you're at if you'd like to do that. Our key right here is we're going to seek the Lord and we're going to pray. Okay? So the altar's open. Lord, speak. Your servants are listening. Thank you, God.